In the previous lecture, we discussed the epinephrine signal transduction pathway. And we finished off by saying the following. When a cell uses the epinephrine signal pathway, it must be able to actually turn off that pathway at the right moment in time because if it can't turn off that pathway, that will lead to many different types of negative effects as we'll discuss in a future lecture. So what I'd like to focus on in this lecture is I'd like to answer the following question. So once that epinephrine signal transduction pathway actually carries out its ultimate goal of producing that specific type of physiological response due to some type of stimulus, how is it that the cells can actually shut down this pathway? What methods can they actually use to shut down this epinephrine signal pathway? Well, basically, there are two points in the epinephrine pathway that the cell can actually use and shut down that pathway. So we have point A and point B, and let's begin our discussion by focusing on point A. So in point A, we basically have that alpha G protein adenylate cyclase complex. And when this complex exists as shown, that adenylate cyclase will basically continue transforming the ATP molecules into the cyclic AMP molecules, which are the secondary messengers in this epinephrine pathway. So ultimately, what causes the alpha G protein to actually bind and stimulate that adenylate cyclase? Well, basically, it's the GTP. When the GTP, guanosine triphosphate, is bound onto that alpha G protein, it increases its affinity for that adenylate cyclase. And so it goes on and binds onto a special side found on the intracellular portion of this cyclase. And once it binds, it increases its catalytic activity and causes it to basically transform the ATP into the cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecules. So ultimately, what the cell has to do is somehow remove the GTP and bind the GDP, guanosine diphosphate, because once the guanosine diphosphate binds onto the alpha G protein, that will cause a decrease in the affinity of the alpha G protein for that cyclase, and that will cause it to actually detach, terminating this cyclase a cyclase's ability to form those cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecules. So it turns out that this alpha G protein actually has a built-in timer. A few, a few seconds to a few minutes following the activation of the alpha G protein by the attachment of the GTP, the alpha G protein itself can actually take a water molecule from the cytoplasmic environment and use that water molecule to hydrolyze the GTP back into GDP. And as soon as that takes place, as soon as we replace the GTP and place a GDP, that will decrease the affinity of the alpha G protein for the cyclase, causing it to dissociate from that cyclase. And once it dissociates, it goes out and finds those, alpha, those beta and gamma units to basically reform this trimer molecule. And once it detaches, that inactivates that adenylate cyclase. So once again, as long as that GTP is bound to the alpha G protein, that alpha G pro protein will remain attached to that adenylate cyclase, which will in turn continue producing those cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecules. So if that G protein is to detach from that cyclase, the GTP must be transformed into GDP. And it turns out that the alpha G protein has something we call GTPase activity, the ability to actually take a water molecule and hydrolyze that GTP into GDP. Now, this hydrolysis doesn't take place immediately after activation of that alpha G protein. And that's because we want to give that alpha G protein, the cell wants to give that alpha G protein some time to actually carry out its function before being activated. And so the hydrolysis usually occurs within a few seconds to a few minutes after the alpha G protein is activated and this gives it plenty of time to actually carry out its function. And so to summarize, let's take a look at this diagram. So 
we have the inactive version of adenylate cyclase. To activate it, to, we basically take that GTP form of the G protein, it goes on and binds and that stimulates that cyclase to produce those cyclic A and P molecules. After a few seconds to a few minutes, once the signal pathway basically carries out its physiological response, what happens is because of this internal GTPase activity, it takes a water molecule from that cytoplasm and we have plenty of water molecules in the cytoplasm so it's never a problem. The water molecule is taken and basically is used to hydrolyze the GTP into GDP and so we release a single phosphate molecule. And so once this is formed, the affinity of the G protein decreases for that uh, adenylate cyclase, it basically dissociate, dissociates and goes on and finds that dimer to form this trimer protein. Now let's move on to diagram B. So this is the second site, the second point in the pathway where the cell can actually deactivate, shut down that pathway. And this is when that epinephrine is bound onto the site on the beta adrenergic receptor. So what is the function of this structure? Well, basically the epinephrine receptor complex actually is used to stimulate the transformation of the GDP alpha G protein form into the GTP alpha G protein form. And the question is, how can the cells inactivate the epinephrine receptor complex and prevent any further activation of the alpha G proteins? So there are two different ways. Let's begin by discussing this pathway here. So one very simple way to actually deactivate this particular structure is for the epinephrine to actually be released, for the epinephrine to simply dissociate. So if the epinephrine dissociates from that site, as shown in this diagram, what that does is it basically inactivates the ability of this beta receptor to basically activate the alpha G proteins. And if the alpha G proteins cannot be activated, they cannot go on and activate those adenylate cyclases. Now, under what conditions will the epinephrine actually dissociate? Well, let's use a bit of chemistry. Let's discuss the Le, uh, let's discuss Le Chatelier's principle. So, according to Le Chatelier's principle, if the concentration of the free epinephrine molecules found in the surrounding area decreases, to basically uh, to basically compensate for that decrease in the free floating epinephrine concentration, we know that the epinephrine that is bound will begin to dissociate. And we see that this process takes place with great likelihood only when that epinephrine, the free epinephrine concentration is low. So one method of inactivation involves the epinephrine actually dissociating out of that cavity of that 7TM receptor shown here. This is the cavity and this is the 7TM receptor. Now, when the epinephrine concentration drops in the outside by Le Chatelier's principle to basically compensate for that drop in concentration of the free epinephrine, that epinephrine that is bound actually dissociates. So if we have a high concentration of epinephrine in that extracellular environment in its free form, it will not be likely to dissociate and that's why we actually have to depend on this second method. So in the second method, we have a special protein kinase we call the beta adrenergic receptor kinase. And it's basically a kinase protein, which means it uses ATP to actually add or phosphorylate that particular protein. So the beta adrenergic receptor kinase uses ATP to actually phosphorylate the carboxyl terminal side of this protein which is found on the intracellular side. And so we essentially add these negatively charged phosphate groups onto this structure and that decreases its affinity to basically go on and activate these alpha G proteins. On top of that, we have a second type type of molecule, a protein we call beta arrestin that goes on and binds to these phosphate groups and that further decreases the ability of these 
uh, complexes, the epinephrine receptor complex, to actually activate those alpha G proteins. So, in a second mode of inactivation, the beta adrenergic receptor kinase basically phosphorylates the carboxylic terminal end of that epinephrine receptor complex on the intracellular side of that protein. So this protein kinase uses ATP to phosphorylate it and then the beta arrestin binds onto these phosphate groups and that inactivates the receptor's ability to stimulate those alpha G proteins to basically transform the GDP into the GTP form of that alpha G protein. So these are the different ways by which the cells that use the epinephrine pathway can actually deactivate or shut down the pathway from uh, and thereby preventing different types of negative side effects as we'll discuss in a lecture to come.